What's up, everybody? This is Jake Saldati with the Hit or Die podcast. We'd like to thank the Trinity Bat Company for sponsoring this episode. The West Coast premier wood bat supplier. You can get your custom ash, birch, and maple bats. Coaches can grab a pro fungo, and they even have a great selection of training bats. We also love their fantastic apparel. Get a great quality product with amazing customer service. We were fortunate enough to spend a couple hours at the facility and got to see the process from start to finish. It's an awesome family-ran business that's passionate about their product, and they truly care about the people who use it. They were kind enough to donate a couple bats to give away to our audience, so keep an eye out on the Hit or Die Twitter page for the bat giveaway. Visit Trinity on the web at trinitybatco.com or on Twitter and Instagram at trinitybatco. Again, we'd like to thank Trinity Bat Company for sponsoring this episode of the Hit or Die podcast. Feel the difference, enhance performance, play like a pro. You're listening to the Hit or Die podcast with hosts Jake Soldati and Chad Rothberg. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 14. Uh, we're here with Rick Vanderhoek, the head baseball coach at Cal State Fullerton. A little bit about coach. Attended Lakewood High School. Played at Cerritos Junior College for Coach Horton. After Cerritos, he attended Cal State Fullerton was a member of the 1984 National Championship team, longtime assistant for the Titans, for Coach Garrido, Larry Cochelle, and George Horton, has two College World Series titles, spent two seasons at Cal State Northridge, 2009 to 2011 was a UCLA with Coach Savage, and on June of 2011 was named the head coach at Cal State Fullerton. He's been a five-time Big West Coach of the Year, you gotta you gotta go on hit the website and Another look at guy. his bio, yeah. you know, and just read all about his career. It's an amazing career. It's you gotta go check it out. Uh, you know, Coach Van Herk, thanks for coming on the show with us. Not a problem, fellas. Talking with Coach Purse, and we spent a little time with it. As much as you'd spent here at Fullerton and been to the College World Series, both at Rosenblatt and at uh, TD Ameritrade, I'm sure you're a little old school. Well, I've won every time <laughs> at. Uh, Rose. Rosenblatt, and I've even got two second place pit, uh, times at Rosenblatt. So it's um, a touch of the heart, but uh, TD Meritrade is where baseball's got to the 21st century. It, it's an amazing venue for the players to walk in. Uh, the locker rooms are second to none where I've been, uh, with the exception of Texas A&M. That stadium's pretty good. <laughs> But they've, you know, it's it's modern baseball now. I mean, it was cool at Rosenbatt when you got off the bus and walked through the fans all the way and walked right into the stadium and go down and find a place to sit while you waited for the next game to where now you walk through a rail and it's like you're in the major leagues. And I think the guys enjoy it. I've yet to win a game in that stadium. I'm 0-4. So one of these days, I hope to get one W in that place, but you never know. I mean, you're Fullerton through and through. Uh, played here, coached here for all those years. 2011, what was the moment like being named the head coach at Cal State Fullerton? Well, the whole thing was is kind of weird. Uh, I didn't know Dave was trying to get the Tennessee job. Uh, we'd gotten beat. I was going back to perfect game in uh, Fort Myers, and I landed in Atlanta, and I got off, and my phone, I turned it on, and it just starts going, beep, 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 beep. And I'm going, Jesus, who's trying to get a hold of me so bad? And I had like 65 text. And so I'm looking, and I'm going, okay. And so when I sat down, I got on my computer, started typing in and seeing what's going on. And I saw that Dave took the job here, uh, got super excited and spilt my coffee on my computer, so I didn't have the computer for the rest of the trip. Uh, but I called Brian Quinn. Brian Quinn was on my – he was the athletic director here, and he was on uh, one of the messages, and I called him and said, hey, fill me in. He goes, where are you at? And I said, well, I'm in Florida. I won't be home for four more days. And so when I came home, I came and met with those guys and – it was promising, but you know, Fullerton's a different place. Um, they had a meeting while I was gone with about 200 alumni and they all threw their two cents in there as it went about. And, um, uh, 
I got lucky that they liked me. I must have not yelled at all of them too much. <laughs> and, you know, it was kind of exciting. I went and did an interview and actually went over to Yorba Linda Country Club and just kind of sat there. They had a member guest tournament going on. And so I went and sat in there and just got away where I couldn't be reached. I didn't feel like talking to anybody or answering any questions. So I just kind of went and hit off over at the country club, got a call later that night and it was done. Were you waiting for this one? I mean, I can't imagine I how many opportunities you've had in the past to take over programs. Well, I lived here and worked at UCLA. So y'all came up from UCLA today. You yeah. can know what I drove back and forth every day for three years. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But my family was set. My kids were in school. My wife's a teacher. And it was easy for one of us to do something than everybody having to do something. And I'd stayed a little bit in contact with Brian and Steve Detola, uh, who's my supervisor now and actually travels with me everywhere we go. The guys call him Coach Detola. But it was, um, who knows? I mean, maybe there was a job. Maybe there wasn't. I really didn't sniff around. I, I I like being in one place. I'm not one that's going to bounce around till I can find something that is great. This place was great. UCLA was great. We were good. We had just got beat in the finals of the College World Series when we came home. So it all went well for me. So uh, on your staff, what are some of the things when recruiting? Um, ability, but the intangible things like how pitchers react after a hitter gets a hit after they strike somebody out or hitters striking out for our listeners out there that are hard nineties stuff like that when recruiting. Yeah. We want to find guys that can play baseball and guys that want to win, you know, Colton Eastman, he's a Fresno kid guy was a winner. He hated to lose emotional and he learned to control his emotions, but he hated to lose. And I hate to lose. I don't go home. If we, if we don't win, I sit here until I'm done and everybody's asleep. Then I go home and I go into the jacuzzi. <laughs> My dog and I, we go sit out in the backyard and we go into the jacuzzi. And when I'm ready to go in, I go in. And when I wake up, everybody's gone. It's great. Nobody had to take any beating because I'm a bad loser. I don't like it. Well, and I think you come here, you, you know, we've talked about it on the way down here. You, you know, you don't have a football program. And, and Coach Marietta was saying, uh, you know, you are the football program here. Well, our football program has been undefeated since 1992. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually sell shirts in the bookstore that That's say great. that. I love football. I, I can remember when I played, and I think it was 83 or 84. Uh, we had a pretty good football team. Damon Allen was the quarterback, and Mark Collins played defensive back. And we played um, a bowl game in Fresno. And that was the first time I'd experienced the fog. <laughs> yeah. And I think I was going like three miles an hour. And I think I was going fast on the way down there because we drove Coach Rousey's uh, dad's station wagon and I was the driver. <laughs> and, I mean, you couldn't even see out the window. But, you know, we got there and we all bunked up in one room. It was a bowl game. And it was awesome. It was fun to do. And I used to go to every football game here as I did at UCLA and, I like Saturdays. I like Saturday college football. And if, if Nebraska is playing because my wife's an alum, um, we don't practice unless they're terrible. Then I'll call it practice because <laughs> she's a bad loser too. But I mean, you, you, you come here, you know, you're coming to play baseball and you, your expectations, you should know what you're getting into. Um, you know, social media stuff, you guys follow that or your staff, they follow what kids are doing online, tweeting online, Instagramming. Well, you, as we've talked about earlier, I'm not the computer person. <laughs> uh, my oldest daughter runs my Twitter because I don't know how to do that. And the guys pay attention to it and they'll like send it to me where I can look at, but I can't find anybody or anything on that. <laughs> we spoke to coach Savage and we got into um, the third assistant and um, you know, it wasn't passed by the NC2A council. Um, can you just give your thoughts and, on what you think about it? I think it's an awful rule uh, not to have three paid guys. We have 35 guys, and one guy has to work for free. And I'm not so disappointed in the small schools. I'm disappointed in the big schools. I'm disappointed in the Big Ten. Um, 
not voting for it. They got more money than God. And, and, you know, Ohio State's against it. They're all against it. It's like, why? Are you just going to hire another football coach and pay him 250000 So what's paying a guy thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars? It gets another guy into the venue of coaching because it's hard to be a college coach. Young guys can't get in our business. When I started, uh, I think I made like four hundred bucks a month, and I got to go recruit everywhere. I used to just go sit at Blair Field when before Long Beach played there, and they had leagues down there, and you just watch guys play games. Now we have to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars over short periods of time to go away. And and it just, it doesn't make any sense. The NCAA sometimes makes sense, but not all the time. I mean, that rule I think is completely idiotic, but that goes with football. You know, they have to make sure the numbers stay skew with everything going across the board and I think they made a mistake on that one. We got a couple of years to wait. You know, I was reading some stuff on it, and I, I was telling uh, Chad earlier, and we even talked to Coach Savage about it. I can't find any reason to justify voting no on it. I can't find what the problem is. And some people have said, well, they attached softball to it. Well, how can you not attach softball to it? Because if you don't, that's going to be the reason they voted no on it. Gender equity. And so I've read some other stuff with the Big Ten. They've been trying to get stuff more equal for them with their start times because they have to deal with weather. I mean, is that, is it just a little bit of a gripe for them? No, totally. Because every one of those cold weather places has an indoor place to work out. They have an indoor place. They got a half a billion dollar indoor facility at Ohio state or Michigan and whatever. And if the football doesn't want to share it with them, that's their problem within their institution. But you know, it's not bad. I'm going to schedule a series in 2022 at Ann Arbor in April. And uh, Eric said, yeah, the weather would be pretty good, 35 to 40. I said, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it's what you do. I mean, why are they allowed in football to play Division one one AA teams? They just make money on it. And they just beat the crap out of them unless they play Appalachian State. Then they end up losing, and it ruins the whole thing. But there, there's no fairness in athletics across the board, except with the lower-level sports like baseball or whatever. There's only, what, 30 teams in the country that have a chance to win a national championship in football? 30? Maybe. That's fair. And, you know, well, what about the other 200 and yeah. 50? They don't have a chance. No. So... They're crying this, they're crying that, but they get their fair share. They get their fair share of everything, and they get to set the rules. It, there, it, there's not equality in it. In baseball, anybody can win. We've won a couple times. Coastal Carolina won. Kent State got there one year. At least you get a different flavor. Even in basketball, it's a long shot, but you can throw some smaller schools in there if they want to invest in the product, like Gonzaga invests in their product to do it. But do you think Fresno State has any chance to win a national championship in football? No. And, and it's not right because I think they have some good teams. They got some guys that can roll. I'm, I think they got a good shot. Tedford's amazing. He's he done is. really good. Tedford's a Cerritos College guy. Went to junior college, played quarterback at Cerritos College. I had no idea. I didn't either. We should know that. He <laughs> was he was there when, when I played baseball, Warren High School. So, follow, I mean, we're talking about the third assistant. To follow up on that, you know, I played college ball. I know how significant scholarships are. 11.7. You just said you have a 35-man roster. I mean, do you think that will ever increase? I hope not. And why I hope not is California state system is still a cheap education, affordably. So if they give more, USC hasn't won in a long time, and they dominated when they had 40 scholarships, and they'd redshirt guys that were Hall of Famers probably. But, you know, I think that makes it a little fair because they have everything, but they have to divvy their money different ways. It's like Vanderbilt – they have a lot of scholarship need aid. Stanford has need aid. Sure, they got a smaller pool to pick from, but they have more need-based money. 
we're all all state schools with junior colleges, which I don't know, we have probably 110, 120 in California with 27 or 30 state schools. All that money comes out of the same uh, pocketbook as they put money out to kids. So they don't get enough to do it. Even a full financial aid guy can't go to school and not have debt when they're done. I'm an offensive guy and I've all, I'm old school. I'm always, you know, complete hitter, used all the field. I didn't really come up about the launch angle. To me, it was just like, it just happened. You know, you just swung, you hit the ball. You know, at Fullerton, what do you got? What do you preach? Your philosophy on hitting? And like I said earlier, I just think the two strike approach is getting out of the game. Guys are okay with striking out. And that, that was, it wasn't like that. Guys were mad about striking out. Nowadays, it's either all or nothing. And, and, uh, so what's your philosophy here at Fullerton and what you guys work on? Well, there's one thing we're going to do here now that one, the kids don't know how to get a hit. Used to be guys knew how to get hits. Tony Gwen, Wade Boggs, they knew how to get hits. Rod Carew, they could just shoot a ball the other way when the guy would shift on them and say, okay, you're going to throw it out there. I'm going to, I'm just going to shoot it. Now it's about the homer. Um, and now they're playing with the homer ball because I watched the Dodgers Yankees last night and that ball was jumping. You know, and it's crazy how they go about it. But we want guys that kind of know how to hit. So we're going to have an over-the-line tournament. And as I gave the guys a test the other day on baseball, and you two as you walked in here, <laughs> yes, you know, the freshmen, two of them knew who Abner Doubleday was. And it's like, you're a baseball player. Be a baseball player. You got to learn. But you have to learn how to get hits. I'll use Justin Turner as an example because he hits high with two strikes, has a high two-strike average. But that guy knew how to get hits before he started hitting balls over the fence. He didn't hit balls over the fence in college. And with the live bat, he didn't hit balls over the fence in college. But he knew how to get a hit when he had to get a hit. Guys on second and third, boom, pop one over the second baseman's head and drive in two. To our other guys, it's just one swing, one thing. They're programmed so young to do things one way. Well, you have to do things a different way. And we don't totally have a certain hitting style because every guy is different. Left-handed guys hit different than right-handed guys. Six-foot, five-inch guys hit different than five-foot-inch guys. Long arm guys hit different than short arm guys. You just have to know how to fight some pitches off to give yourself a chance to go. And there's times where the strikeout is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. If you're at bases loaded and nobody out, do you really want to hit a ground ball to short to put it in play to drive in one run to get two outs? No. Change it up and go the next way and, and you know do it a different way. But we just want to teach them how to be baseball players. And it takes a while for some guys. It takes a while. And, and that goes with the whole circuit of everything. They used to always play games to win. I want guys that know how to win. And now it's about a showcase. How fast do I throw it from shortstop to first base? What's my velocity when it leaves the bat? I don't care. An out is an out, and a hit is a hit. And once you learn how to do those type of things, you'll have a better feel of the baseball game. And that's some things that we just try to teach as we go along. And what we do, you need a short stroke somewhat, but long swings can still hit balls. You just got to hit the right ones. If you got a long swing, you don't want the ball in. Get it out over the plate, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you got little short arms and you can handle the ball in, then you get up on the plate and look for the ball in and turn on it and burn on it. But you just have to have a feel for who you are. And I don't think kids know who they are. It's crazy when a kid goes, who do you like to watch hit? Albert Pujols. It's like you're five foot seven, 160 pounds. Albert Pujols is six foot three, 275 pounds. You can't hit like him, dude. Pick somebody out. Mike Trout's the guy now. Nope, you're not Mike Trout. He's a freak. Yeah. So, 
everybody's into the travel ball and like when they have so many coaches trying to tell them things, I think that's where you're saying kids don't know who they are. And I think that has a lot to do with it. When this guy might be saying one thing, this guy might be saying another thing. And, um, you know, they lose fact of, you know, I just want to hit, I just want to get better. It's baseball. Baseball is supposed to be fun. And all that stuff is just extra, you know, back when we played, it was just, let's go play, man. Go play and see who wins. Yeah. And we do that. We play and, and winning winners get rewarded. Losers don't. But that's wins and losses. You got to figure it out. You got to figure out how not to like losing. Too many guys accept it. Yeah. I mean, you see high school guys now after after the game, they go get on their phones. I mean, after I lost, I, I would not leave the dugout. I wanted, I didn't want to see my family. I didn't want to, I waited till everybody was left, like you did. You sit in the, in the, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to talk about it. I know I had a bad game. I know we lost, you know, kids now, it's just like, oh, whatever. And I know there's always another game. I get that when they say there's a next one, but you got to take things personal. Absolutely. People don't take things personal anymore. Absolutely. Well, we were talking about the high five and, you know, what'd you say to the parents? It's okay to, it's okay to get a home run hit off you. You know, I mean, be mad. Yeah. Right. Be pissed off for a minute and then get over and get ready to get back up there and make the next pitch. Absolutely. And um, we got a sports psychologist that we pay like 30 grand to just to try to learn how to deal with that type of stuff because they've never dealt with it. They they don't know how to do it and they don't know how to deal with it. It goes different ways, but it's a different society now. Easiest way to put it. Well, I mean, you, I remember you coming to Reedley and doing a, a coaching clinic with coaches per staff. And, you know, you were pretty adamant about how your players come to the ballpark dressed, the way they wear their pants, stirrups, all that stuff. It's um, a baseball uniform. Exactly. They don't even know how to put it on. No. Like when I was in high school, the guy I played for is a guy named John Herbold. He's in the ABCA Hall of Fame. I, I would say he's the high school version of Bob Bennett, wrote books, uh, Stanford grad that taught high school English and was a baseball coach. But, you know, like Bob, it it was so boom, boom, boom on how you're supposed to do it. And so now those dads that went on and became little league coaches, they probably had pretty good teams because they knew what they learned as they go because not every player is going to be a professional player. They're going to go on to be something else in life and leave that down it's like you talked about Stevie. So uh, I'm dead set on stuff that we did and extremely successful at that period of time when we got together at UCLA. And then Stevie would go, well, Coach Bennett would do this. And I'm going, wow, that's pretty crazy. And now we do Bob Bennett stuff at Cal <laughs> State Fullerton, which Bob Bennett stuff and Augie Garrido stuff were all Pete Biden stuff. And that's what Purse said. He said Purse Purse said Fresno State and Fullerton were almost mere images of each other back then. Very um, like minded. Yeah, and very much. It's like uh we always played Fresno. Always played Fresno State. And and every time we go, Coach Biden would bring a bag of oranges into the dugout. And I looked over at Coach Garrido and I go, Why does Coach um Biden bring oranges every time? He goes He's paying me for when we had to clear the orange field at his house. I said, Skip, you never cleared out the orange field. He goes, I know, but he made me go. <laughs> we had a little chat with Coach Purse before we got here, and he'd mentioned that. Was that 95? 95, Kotze. Was that, that team was ridiculous. But you guys made it. Was it at Fresno State? They, you guys made a trip, a series of Fresno State. And that dogs were really good, pretty good that year. They made it to they uh, hosted a regional that year. Yeah, and uh, he said it was a pretty good series between the dogs and the Titans. They always had battles though. Oh, I mean, even oh, when Bennett was there, it was oh, oh, it was almost it was either the first or second series of the year. It seemed like and it, yeah, because we'd open up at we'd play Stanford and then we'd play Fresno, and it was like even before the Super Bowl, we used to start super early in those days, and you know for us. At Fullerton, we always had to go to ASU for regionals. We couldn't win. Couldn't win. I don't think Fullerton's ever won a regional at ASU. But in 79, they went to Fresno and won. In 84, we went to Fresno 
and won. And it was a dog. We played San Diego State at that point with Chris Gwynn, not Tony, but Flavio Alfaro, who was the 84 Olympic shortstop. And it was a war. It was a war. And then in the 80s after that, we had some wars because we had some Fresno guys on our team. And uh, one guy, Paul Cameron's dad, Mark, actually played at Fresno State. And they still live there. And a guy named Mike Ross, yep. who's a teacher and a coach, he was. they were both Fresno City guys. And um, we had some wars. Vic the Brick was the TV guy at that point in Fresno. You guys probably were barely born. <laughs> and, and he was calling us the Titans bar- Barbarians because we got in like five fights in one weekend. And the big old Salazar umpire guy booted Coach Garrido, and Coach Garrido spiked his freaking glasses on the ground. And he had it all on TV. <laughs> it was great because the Rosses and, and those guys, the cameras, they filmed it all and sent the VHS down to us. <laughs> I think I still have that tape. Oh, that one of the classic cabinets. Uh, you know, speaking of Coach Carrito, you know, what did he mean to you personally? You know, not not baseball obvious, but personally as a friend and a longtime friend. Super good friend. I mean, super good. I was calling him the first time um, that I was taking my own team, not my own team, but our own team, and me as the head coach to Omaha. We were home, and I had to come home because um, my uh, middle daughter was graduating high school, and my youngest was graduating middle school, and we had a few days, and we had played in Louisville, and um, so I'm in the backyard, and I was home for like a day and a half by myself, well, with the team being in Louisville, and so I call Coach Carrito. I go, okay, man, fill me in. What do I need to do in this? He goes, just don't do anything you don't want to do. And then I called Coach Lopez, Andy Lopez, and I said, all right, Coach, tell me what to do. He goes, just don't do what you don't want to do. They're going to tell you you have to do this. You don't have to do anything. And I said, you go. And actually, we thought we had that first game one against Vanderbilt and all their guys in the major leagues until it started. Uh, they said it was going to rain, and it rained about an hour and a half later, but – Eshelman was dialed in pretty good. But, no, he was amazing. I I really like red wine now because of him. He taught me how to drink (laughs) red wine. And now I'm – that dabbles into my taste buds and my pocketbook. (laughs) I mean, his coaching tree, too, from here, you know, with you guys and Coach Kernan. um, I don't know what he's up to now. but uh, I think Bill retired again. Yeah. But let's say again. Because he retired once from Fullerton, once from Northridge, once from Bakersfield, and once from Sac State. So I think as soon as he gets tired of writing plays, he goes and does baseball for a couple of years. <laughs> gets his fix. To, to energize him back up. Uh, for you all the years here with Coach Garrido and Coach Horton, um, any particular team that, that made that run that you'll never forget? I mean, there was one better than – I mean, they're all I mean, obviously special and – all take great players and or even in specific moments that you could recall. I mean, it, it, now I, the Oklahoma State, which was the '94 team, um, we won at Oklahoma State. That was back when Gary Ward was still there, and they were good. And Stillwater was hard place, so you had to play in Stillwater. Hard place to play. I mean, the people are right on top of you. And they would maybe lose a spit wad out of their mouth and so on. And it was rocking. And uh, that one was pretty crazy. Um, that we were going just, they were going ballistic in the dugout and it was packed. And I was coaching third and I couldn't get anybody's attention. And um, so I finally just gave him the wave away. And Coach Garrido, I didn't hear him, but this is what he said in the dugout. And he goes, you can be replaced. <laughs> and then this is probably the greatest story ever. We've been fortunate enough to play pretty good in Baton Rouge. Uh, the box has been very friendly to the Titans. In 1992, we went there and won. In 1995, we went there. And we were pretty good. And they were pretty good. Coach, 
Coach Garrido has a meeting up in his room, and he's going, now, hey, these guys are going to be tight. The place is going to be rocking. we got to stay positive. And our leadoff hitter was a kid named Tony Miranda. And Tony walked on four pitches and took off stealing on the second pitch and got thrown out. <laughs> and Coach Garrido was in his little car that year, that little scooter, because yeah. he ruptured his Achilles at Northridge earlier. <laughs> And I look across the field, and he hops on one foot across the <laughs> dugout, and he's got Miranda by the jersey. <laughs> and I'm just going, oh, my God, what are we in for? <laughs> and I think we got out of there pretty good. <laughs> but that was hilarious. That was the funniest thing i ever seen. I couldn't imagine, man, having all – I mean, we, we need more than an hour to get into all of it. But, you know, he also did, for the love of the game, was that uh, – was that fun to talk to him about? Was did he enjoy doing that? Yeah, big screen he, debut. He liked it. I think Jose Moto liked it more than him because Jose's the infielder that's in there. Um, as he goes, you know, we got an autograph poster of that somewhere. I think it's in storage <laughs> over there. That's a Costner one that I'm going to get autographed from uh, Old Durham. Um, but he was just unique. He would have probably made millions and millions and millions of dollars selling real estate or doing something with it. His gift of talking was amazing. And his gift of relating to the kids was amazing. He could get the point across and yell at you and you would get done and say, thank you, Skip. I mean, it was, he had the gift of gab. Some people can communicate that way. Today's society has a lot of trouble doing that yeah, because it's not a computer or their thumb. Like us, I don't let our guys take phones to breakfast or anything. They're going to learn to actually talk. They just, everything's about the phone. It's it's everywhere. I mean, it is driving. I remember, I think, uh, who's the Louisville basketball coach? Denny Crum? Oh, no. Uh, uh, Rick Pitino. Yes. Yeah, Pitino. He, when they went to the Final Four... He made them all, or once they get off the bus or something, he makes them all put their phones in like a, a briefcase that they lock up, and right. they can't have them like the whole trip they're there. I thought that's crazy, but like you said, a lot of people are, don't know how to communicate with each other. No. And and once you get a high school kid that comes in, you know he's trying to make new friends but doesn't know how to do things. It's it's just difficult nowadays. It, it, it's super hard. We've spent. Probably three hours of meetings. We've had meetings every day on the phone because Coach Jenkins isn't down here yet. He leaves on Wednesday. So we put him on speakerphone and we spent three hours of a nine hour week talking about communication. How can we get them to communicate with each other? Just talk. I don't care if you turn around and say, Hey, how's your girlfriend doing? At least say something to a guy. They don't talk to each other. They're monks. And they don't even look you in the eye. No. You know, when you talk to them, and I was always taught, I was old school, you you shake somebody's hand firm and you look them in the eye. You know, it's a sign of respect, but, you know, it's just. Well, and this is your family. I mean, you're going to be on the road with these guys, yeah. roommating with these guys. This yeah. is, and it's not just after the three or four years you're here. It's lifelong. Yep. You know, I think it's very important, that, that communication level. I, I still talk to probably a third of the guys that I played with her, at least the third. They'll, they'll call and say, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, shut up. Well, and you guys have a fantastic alumni, uh, yeah. the support. I mean, what's that mean to you too? It, the alumni thing is huge. And so I, I gave a little test just to see what the guys know, but now they have to go back and research some guys on certain names that I just throw out names that I don't throw out the big names. I don't throw out the names that they're going to know. It's not Mark Kotze, Matt Chapman, Ricky Romero, Tim Wallach. It's Tom Thomas. And they have to figure out what his nickname was. It's John Fischel, who I think is going into our Hall of Fame. And John Fischel is like second or third all time in the amount of hits in the NCAA over four years on the all time list. And they got to come back and give me some dope on him as it goes. And then 
I say, okay, now you call him and ask him some questions. And I'll give him the phone number and say, all right, there you go. Call him. You have to talk to him. Don't text him. Call him. You know, Bob Caffrey. You have any idea who Bob Caffrey is? Bob Caffrey was a catcher in 84. He was a catcher on the 1984 Olympic team. Third round, 13th pick by the Montreal Expos. Never got out of single A. They got to come back and tell me that. They got to tell me that. And then they got to tell me what else he did because he also played quarterback on the football team here as they go with that stuff. But just trying to get him to reach back into the, what's going on. And at our dinner that we do, which is dinner with the Titans, there's probably 100, 150 former Titans that come. You know, sometimes more because we play the alumni of the game this year, the next day. But the alumni game, there's 150 guys here. Mm. And from even before I knew, guys from the 60s come to the alumni game. One year we caught an imposter. <laughs> we couldn't find his name anywhere. <laughs> Donated 500 bucks, so that was all right. Uh, well, but it's important. I, and even at our high school you know, to know your history, have pride of where you're at. I think it's, in, I mean, not, I think it is important. You know, you got to know who, who did it before you, who helped build what the field you're playing on. You Absolutely. Know, you talked uh we talked to a person, he was saying, you know, back in the day, you guys basically played at a high school facility. Oh yeah. You know, well, and, and our stands were the Rose Bowl seats for the parade that they stored for the year. So after the Rose Parade, they'd put them up here. And before the Rose Parade the next year, they'd come take them down and take them to the Rose Parade. It worked. You know, how did you guys prepare for other environments, for the bigger stadium environment? That's why we play the schedule that we play. I, I don't need to play what we play, but I'm not soft. I'm not playing soft teams. I don't want to just get W's to get W's this year. We open up at Stanford, play Tulane at home, go to Texas week three. And then we have Xavier, who's a pretty good club coming in. Then we have Texas A&M coming in. Then we start conference. Yeah. So, you know, you could be five and 15. Then we've done it before. In 2004, we were 14 and 15. And then we turned it around and won a national championship. But you can't teach the experience of playing in certain certain environments unless you get in them. Right. And if you're going to go to the College World Series, you might have to go on the road. You know, until we built this stadium, I think 2000 was the first, 2001 was the first time we played a home uh, regional. And, and now we get to play, if we play good, we get to play at home. So if you host, the percentages are way up that you're going to win. Even though we haven't won one that we've hosted in my career, we won at Long Beach, we won at Louisville, but you have to learn to play in those environments. Yeah. So for our audience out there, good information is uh, if you're interested in a college, go learn the history. You know, you don't know what you're walking into. Uh, you know, like, like Vandy said right now, uh, you get a test. You might get a test on the history and, and trust me, uh, he had some things to say about people that didn't know the answers. So you got to know the answers. You got to know the history. If that's where you want to go, um, you know, do a background on it. Well, even more, I, it's taking pride in what you're about to exactly. do. Exactly. You know, take yeah. pride in the work you're about to put in. Yeah. it's. I mean, yeah. Know the history of the game. Uh, here's the last story that I'm going to tell you guys. <laughs> okay. So Rod Carew lives pretty close around here. Lives in Anaheim Hills, maybe five minutes. We had a guy that was the next door neighbor of Rod Carew and he was in pro ball and he was hitting in the cage and we were doing drills in the outfield. And, um, Rod comes walking across the field in his Panama hat because he was known for wearing that hat off the field. And so I had the outfielders were all sitting there talking and I go, guys, that's Rod Carew. They all look around and go, that's Rod Carew guys. That's Rod Carew. And they go, I go, you know who Rod Carew is? And he goes, yeah, the guy that Adam Sandler sold a song, a song about. And I'm going, dude, <laughs> that's 3,000 <laughs> hits, dude. That's Hall of Famer. Adam Sandler. Yeah. That's what came to mind. <laughs> yep. Rod that's Carew. what came to mind. They didn't have any idea who the guy was. None. <sighs> and it's like, come on. you got. That's just knowing baseball. That's not a, Yeah. 
Like you, you were giving us the test and, you know, we might not know some things about Fullerton, you know, cause we didn't go there or whatnot, but you know, you got to know baseball. I mean, if I saw Rod Crew or you told me that, you know, it's like Roberto Clemente or any of those guys walking right in front of you. Or, That's a good one. I'm going to ask that. How many guys know who Roberto Clemente is? Hopefully they know Jackie Robinson. <laughs> they know who that is. But that's because he's in today's yeah, true. modern eyes. But when they watch a baseball game, you don't watch a baseball game anymore. You watch a close-up on this guy and that guy. Mm-hmm. Back when I watched baseball games, it was a camera up top. You actually got to see what a relay was. You yeah. know, none of these guys have set up in the cheap seats. So they don't get to watch what happens, how the guys move around the field. You're up close. I have good seats at the Angels because I like to watch Mike Trout hit. But, you know, once in a while, I'll go up to the top and just kind of look and see what those guys look like on the field. Yeah, even positioning for hitters. And, exactly. You know. This pitch to that pitch, you, you know, you're always moving depending how, on count. How, how somebody plays without the ball. Yeah. When a ball's hit, how many guys actually gravitate to different spots? They don't see it. Well, and we've talked about it recently. You know, there's where we're from. I've had some conversations, and there's kids. You know, they don't I, even watch. Baseball. They don't even watch the games. They don't. They're not watching college, or they're not even watching the big leagues. And I'm no. thinking, you know, when you have some tools, you're you're already a decent player. If you really, really wanted to do this and take interest, I mean, I don't understand how you can't be that uh, unaware of what's going on. You have to love it all. You have to love it. And and, uh, AAA Park has still got to be beautiful. It is. It is. It It is. It's beautiful. And so go just sit there for four innings and go up and watch. You've got to find a way to be able to get a ticket. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. They're not expensive. I mean, even to force them to go watch a YouTube video of somebody doing tea work or uh, something. I mean, we've got to literally make it homework. I have a uh, whole library of videos that we can just send out at will just so they can watch, you know, Brett Butler bunting. They don't even know what bunting is. Some of them or Brett Butler, huh? Or, <laughs> or yeah, Brett. They definitely don't know who <laughs> Brett Butler is, but when Dave Roberts got that stolen base, in the, in the world series and Dave Roberts, a great guy, but now they don't even know. Plus they were like five when, when it happened. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, it's been on recently. I remember watching that series. And at the time I didn't maybe understand how important that moment was, but I continued to, to try to learn on the game. And, and over time realized, I mean, that turned the whole thing around the whole thing. It, it, it changed the dynamic of everything that happened. And it was and a base running play, and maybe more times than not that happens. And that's another thing that's kind of taken a backseat is base running. Oh yeah, crazy base stealing. There's no yeah. base stealing because they they hit so many home runs, they want to be able to do it. I, you know, I had a guy that played for me named Reed Johnson, played 13 years in the big leagues. Yep, on 13 one year contracts, <laughs> and he had his best years in Toronto. And Toronto hit bombs at that time. He goes, I go, why do you only have like four stolen bases? He goes, because I'm not allowed to run. I said, I could steal third base like half the time I get on second because they just don't pay attention. But the one time that I get thrown out and the guy hits a home run the next pitch, then it's my ass. And he goes, Dave, I'm getting paid as long as I can get paid. That's That's bad, though. That's... This game, man, money is too important. Oh, yeah. Just play the game hard, play it right, respect the game, and the game will reward you. Exactly. Uh, the respecting of it. Because the baseball gods know. They do. They know. They know. And they know they need to do things the right way. Well, we've heard it a bunch, you know, especially Augie, you know, any by any is one thing I took away from it is that you're not going to get something for nothing. No. Never. No, there's sacrifice. There's no shortcut to to getting where you want to get. You know, I know 2019 didn't end the way you wanted it to. And but 2020, can you guys talk a little bit about some of the recruits coming in and, and what you're expecting out of this 2020 group? Well, I hope the position players can play because we lost the catcher, the shortstop, the second baseman, and the center fielder. So you build a club up the middle – the one advantage we do have is we had seven freshmen that pitched significantly for us last year that are all back. 
Um, so those guys who got wide eyed in a hurry and couldn't get out of their rut should be better for them um, to go. And, and we have a whole fresh thing as we go with it, but I think they're all pretty good. Now it's just a matter of fact that they have to think they're pretty good. I think we have some strength behind the plate, uh, which you can't pitch if you can't hit. Um, capable shortstops, capable second baseman, and I got a couple freshmen I think can patrol center field. But it, it's going to be different. You know, we don't have the guys that we've had in the field now. We got a freshman named Rapetti who will play third base, who I think is really good. But how is he going to handle failure before he can come up the other side? Um, the Garcia kid who you guys met earlier, he's a baseball player. He'll be fine. And he's just got to lead them. And they have to understand that, like we try to teach, and I try to teach them, nobody needs to be great. If everybody's good, you got a chance to be great. But one guy being great doesn't make everybody good. So just learn to do their things with it. But we've gotten um, a lot more physical. We've gotten a lot more physical. Our, our guys are a lot bigger and more physical as they go about it. And we'll, but we'll have new guys in new spots. We got enough time to figure it out. It's a marathon. Don't, uh, you don't win in the first mile of marathon. No, no. And you have you have some valley guys here. Uh... Barcelos, uh, you had Colton Eastman here, and then uh, Ortiz from Buchanan's here, and uh, Pavlitich was uh, with Garces. Yeah, he's Bakersfield boy. Um, you know, you saying about those guys, and and you know, I know Barcelos maybe out of the pan a little bit, not not a huge inning guy, but seems like a guy after even talking to Coach Marietta that just bought into everything you guys do here. He's a winner. He's a winner. He does anything he can do to win. And that's what you need. You need guys that can do that. Miggy's got a chance. Miggy's athletic. Um, and he's got some serious juice in it. Let's just see how the failure goes because he's going to see a steady diet of breaking balls for a while. And he's just got to learn. If you can't hit it, don't swing at it. They'll throw you a heater sooner or later. You know, he, he's got a good thing with that. And I like him. I, I like his whole makeup and, I've been testing our guys for the last month. I send out about six emails a day and just a different reminder on each email. And I can look and see who opens up the emails. So when a guy doesn't open it up, it's like, okay. And I kept a little track of them. And then I told him, now, if you don't open my email within four hours, it's a stadium. And if it's six hours, it's three stadiums. If it's the next day, it's six. They they will hate it. As soon as one guy has to do it, they'll all learn to open the emails. But Miggy, open up, answer within an hour, unless he was playing a game. And he'll say, Coach, I was playing. Batting practice. All good. But, you know, I like him. I don't think no more on that group. Treadwell's from uh, Turlock. A little farther. I remember we had Dylan Floro here too. He's at Water Kid. Yeah, Dylan's a good guy. Both um, we had both of them. We had um, Dylan and we had Brock. Okay. And then they have a little brother who's now in the tenth grade. There, he's not little compared to those guys. Well, that's that was Buhack. They had a good club last year. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did. He was a freshman on had a that really, team. We played them last year. That was an excellent team. Yeah, I, I've seen Dylan a few times, and and um, the younger one came down and played on a team down here for a little while in the summer for a couple tournaments. But um, I like the Valley. The, the, we're far enough away and close enough. Right. You know, we had Pacheco for four years. Yeah, another Bullard guy. Yeah. And Clovis, and, and they've grown big, too. And I want to get bigger. And they're big. I like big. I actually had Rossi for one semester. I would have liked to see what oh, he Oh, yeah, he went and played football. Yeah, I would have liked to see what he looked like in college baseball at this point in his life. Yeah. Because he was athletic. He was. He was, he was very athletic. Yeah. Another good team. Lebowski was on that team. Yeah. Right? They won a yeah. Valley went title. To, went to Duke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, the big Lebowski. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about mental makeup, and this will this will we'll wrap it up with this. Um, I think it's appropriate. Uh, we talked to Coach Savage um, about Doctor Ken Revisa mm -hmm. and and uh, 
what he meant to him personally and, and UCLA baseball and knowing his roots here with Fullerton. Could you, you know, talk a little bit about him and, and what he meant to you, a staff and program and I mean, there's too many people to even name that he made an impact to, but just you personally. Well, I I took his class twice, okay, because Kenny here taught sports psychology, and every player was required to take the class. I was one of the first teams that he worked with in 83, and we were on our back in the outfield and and – you know, visualizing stuff. And, and so as Kenny went, he did psychology and then Kenny got in and got to learn to baseball because, you know, he started with Fullerton in the early eighties, went to the angels with Marcel Latchman. Um, when they had that young pitching staff of Jim Abbott, Langston, all those young guys and got hooked in there. And then that's where he got hooked in with Jim with Joe Madden and really the guy that took him all the way along is a guy named Dave Snow, um, who John has breakfast with about once a month. And I talked to about once a month and he's the guy that recruited me to come here. Who's a former Cerritos college guy and him and coach Horton coached together in junior college at LA Valley. And Ken, he, he just, he broke the barrier. Because in that time, that was a no-no in baseball. It's like weights were a no-no for a long time in baseball until Brian Downey started lifting weights and hitting homers. And then it all busted out after that. But Ken was, he was unique. Um, I actually, he used to have grad students that came and, and took his grad program in class and then they would come out here and work with us. Like Doug Chadwick was from Army. And Doug worked with us for two years while he was getting his master's in sports psychology for the Army. Because it's team. And he got that figured out. And then we use a guy named Brian Kane who came after Doug. And those guys all have stuff going all over the place. And he was unique. And John owes that to me because we had this sports psychologist and I said, dude, this guy's no good. We're moving. We're going to this guy here. <laughs> and Kenny lived in Redondo Beach, so it wasn't too bad of a drive. But, you know, he's been there, shoot, probably he was there for like 10 years. And this guy was, he didn't have a cell phone. Didn't have a cell phone. You have to call Claire, his wife. On her cell phone, kind of like calling Coach Marquis. He actually has a cell phone, but he doesn't really know how to use it. You have to call their wives to get a hold of them <laughs> as you go. And it went. But Kenny was amazing. He wasn't only a mentor and whatever. He was a friend, like a good friend, and enjoyed the last his last book, Heads Up Baseball 2. I went and bought it, and then I snuck in line with a whole bunch of people. Uh, at the convention and I walked up and Monica was with him and I just said, shh. And I got in and I go, sir, can you sign this? And you know, he was just signing and rambling and he looks up and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, he was, he was a pleasure and still uses stuff, still uses stuff, still quote him all the time. I'm the king of plagiarism. <laughs> and and, I, right. and I, well, that's what coaches do. Yeah. And I will plagiarize him forever. Yeah, I know. We we mentioned earlier with, with Coach Savage, it'll it'll always be around, always live on. Exactly. And uh, it's, it's always something. Well, we talked about to. it needs to go to the high school level. Absolutely. Oh, it no needs doubt. To get, it needs to get to the high school. That way they're more prepared for. Well, see, the problem is they do everything now. I mean, too much. There's too much hitting lessons. Yeah. There's too much this. Guys that play pro ball need to go back and go to college. But if they played 10 years, they have no money to go to college left because your college money that the pro guys gave you is gone. I got Tyler Pill coming back to be a student assistant here. And he has one year to finish school, and they gave him like $2,000. It's like $2,000. That doesn't do it. So I'll pay the rest. It doesn't matter. But, um, you know, they pro ball sells – they could sell snow to an Eskimo. 
seen a couple of kids get drafted that that's how it worked out for them. Yeah. I tell all the guys, just get your money up front, take it all up front, pay your taxes, take it away. In five years, at least it won't go down. It'll go up. Yeah. And we can only hope that our listeners take it and it's only going to better that younger generation that need to, uh, Hey, gotta, you you want to be a Fullerton Titan? You need to do your homework, learn the program, learn the history, go to the yard, ready to work, and uh, you know be a good teammate. And character is big, you know, obviously. Character is huge. Um, all right, I'll finish on this one. <laughs> we got all the time in the world, yeah. Coach. Right. We're on your time. All right, here you go. Okay, y'all know who Gabe Kapler is, right? Yes. Gabe Kapler should have been on the 1995 Fullerton team, uh, but Gabe was super immature. And after the fall, Gabe got kicked off the team, went back to junior college and woke him up. And when I see Gabe now, he still says, God, that was the greatest thing ever happened to me. But he would have been on that team with Katze and Giambi and all those guys. The greatest college team ever to play, according to what some people say. Yeah. But Kapler got cut in January because he couldn't, he had bad character. That's big. It's 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 worse now too. Oh, way worse. Well, that's because mom and dad feed the monster. We that's what we've talked we talked about. Uh, we had Jason Donald on the on the show. He's from our area. I I, I graduated with him, played against him, grew up playing against well, him. He, he talked about you guys. I yeah, he rec- talked. About I recruited. Him. He said, "Yeah, he, Coach. Uh, well, Coach Hook and and Coach. Shane Costa was his. Shane Costa oh, yeah. was his uh, chaperone. Oh right? yeah, ish or whatever. Um, but yeah, we he just talked about these guys." need to go to college, whether it be JUCO or something, before you go to pro ball, because, yeah, mommy and daddy aren't there cooking you breakfast, doing your laundry and doing all that stuff. You need to grow up. They're not waking you up for class. They're not, you know, telling you to do your homework. You're late for practice. And that's that's a big thing, and that that has to do with character too, you know. Well, I told my guys Friday in our first meeting, 10 minutes early is on time. That's on time. Because if I come early, I want to start. Mm-hmm. It's like when the bus, I when I get on the bus, the bus leaves. So if you ain't on the bus before me, <laughs> you're not making the trip. <laughs> you better find a way to get to the airport and fly to Hawaii. And we had two of them last year that oh. did it. Oh. Wow. They did it. That was Mur. That was Mur helping them. But they can get help that they had to get to the airport. Well, Coach, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I thank Coach Purse for for getting the ball rolling. But thank you guys for taking times out of your day. I know you guys are getting ready to start. First day of school, it's hectic. Uh, you didn't have to do this, and uh, we just we appreciate you joining us. No, I'm all good, fellas. Thanks a lot for coming down. Thank you. Hit or die. Hit or die. It's episode 14. Thanks, everybody. You can stream the Hit or Die podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. The show is also available on YouTube. For news and updates about the show or to get involved, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Hit or Die Podcast.